Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. I'm joined this afternoon by Declan O'Reardon and he is going to be presenting a webinar on interactive application security testing. If you have any questions for Declan, just type them into your questions field there on the control panel. And at the end of the webinar, we will go through your questions one by one. And remember, you don't have to wait until the webinar is finished to type your questions. You can type them in at any point, and we'll just hold on to them till the very end. So that's enough from me now. I'm, I'm going to hand you over to today's presenter, Declan. Hello, Declan. Hello, Dara. And I'll bring up my slideshow. There it comes. OK, can you see that? We can indeed, yes. I hope so. Good, good. OK. Just going to minimize that. And uh, right, so interactive application security testing. It's a, a, a very new term. Um, and I don't claim ownership of the definition of it. But I'm going to try and suggest to you um, what it could, and uh, you know, if you if you have an alternative interpretation, that's fine. Uh, and as you encounter it more and more over the coming years, I, I expect that you'll see more than one way of describing what interactive application security testing is. But it's got the word testing in it, so we should be talking about it, and that's what I'm going to do. So hang on, I'm just going to get control of my screen. Okay, so if I break down the uh, the words in IAST, Interactive Application Security Testing, which is uh, a term Gartner came up with quite recently when they were describing new developments in security testing. Interactive, a, a dictionary definition it would be of two people or things influencing each other. So you could quite reasonably say, well, um, you know, I do hands-on security testing as a skilled security tester, and I don't just use um, sort of passive spidering functionality of the tools. I, I get very interactive by changing um, hidden and uh, disabled fields in the HTML pages, uh, and, and you're interacting. And, that, and that's very good, but there's actually only a few people that I meet uh, who are really good at that sort of thing. Uh, when I consider all the testers and technology people that I've known over the years, and, um, and even all the security people, only a very small percentage are actually really good at doing interactive application security testing. And uh, funnily enough, at UKSTAR, which I should have plugged at the start, um, we will have four of those people. And in fact, pretty much the best ones uh, that are around. Ken Munro is an amazing uh, security tester. He'll be speaking um, at UKSTAR. It's Paco Hope doing a keynote. Bill Matthews, also brilliant tester. And James Whitaker, who who's a very much larger than life person who's written books on security as well. Automated solutions, if you can call it automated, it's, it's something other than automation as well, really. Um, but um, um, there are problems with human beings trying to take on billions of lines of code uh, in an interactive way to doing hands-on security testing. So the A in IAST is um, application. And here I'm particularly talking about a web application. So something that uses um, uh, a, a markup language and uh, to, to communicate with the World Wide Web. And security, because when I first started taking an interest in security, I kind of imagined it was more about um, locking things down and, uh, and, you know, sort of defensive stuff, but, but actually the word originates from the Latin securus, meaning free from care. And, you know, I, I really have trouble with that. I think if, if we can't agree what security is, it's very difficult to provide it to our organizations when there's not a common understanding of what security is. And, and I've seen a lot of campaigns trying to educate people to, to not be free from care, but to be more careful, uh, not um, clicking on uh, emails with attachments and to have better passwords and so on. But really that runs up against you know, the business models that we have. That A lot of staff 
will always click on emails with attachments because that's a normal part of what we do in our day-to-day -day lives is send attachments in our emails. And no matter how many times you have these awareness campaigns, people, I think about one in four, will pretty much always click on the attachment, even if it's malicious. And they have rubbish passwords that they use on social media sites and things like that. So for me now, the meaning of um, security is to actually try and enable people, uh, enables people to just hand over the problems with security to somebody else, which, you know, the image in my mind is that if you have a small child, you'd know that when they're, um, when they're young, no matter how much they cry around the house, if you put them in a car with the engine running, they just go to sleep and, and they're completely free from care. Even if you're drink driving on the wrong side of the road at 200 miles an hour, they, to them it's the same as like, the thing ticking over on the driveway. It's your problem to look after that child, and I think that's the way that I now want to deal with application security problem on behalf of the majority of people who will never really get security. And testing, well, I've worked in testing now. I've been paid to do testing for, wow, my God, it's so long. <laughs> it was like 1988, I think, so it's a long time ago, the first time I was paid to do it. and. You'd think that when you get together with a bunch of testers, you can say, oh, yeah, you know, testing is X. But actually, it's pretty hard to pin down what testing is. And um, I looked up once, well, what, where does the word testing come from? And uh, originally, it was not how we think of it now, but it was the, the pot or vessel that was used in assaying precious metals. And it was only about the 1590s that the trial or examination to determine the correctness of something um, changed the interpretation of the noun test. So the, there was the, the connecting notion that it's ascertaining the quality of a metal by melting it in a pot rather than just describing the pot. And from 1748, it became a verb to examine the correctness of uh, that kind of understanding that we have now. So testing, you know, it, it, it's quite possible that people might say, wait a minute, you know, when I asked, that isn't even really test, it's monitoring, it's instrumentation, but I believe that it's still testing and the meaning of testing can change over time. And I think Michael Bolton has, has a brilliant set of definitions of testing where things that I find particularly useful are um, his, his, his just a list of suggestions and you can add more to these things, but it's something that informs quality assurance but is not in and of itself quality assurance. And he has a bunch of other suggestions here, but I think he makes a very good point that you need to be ready for somebody to ask you, you know, what is testing? If you work in testing and it's what pays your bills, think about what, you know, how would you define testing? And then the security. Now, um, most of the people I work in security actually do governance and compliance work. They, they don't really make applications secure. They deal with a lot of policies and procedures and standards, and it's kind of the complementary side to uh, an audit. But between the auditors and the people doing governance and compliance, very few of them actually understand application security. So they, it's kind of, you know, they're kind of doing each other a favor to, to focus on on processes to recover after a breach and things like that. What I'm drawing here is that you could have, uh, like somebody introduce a rule on a building site. Everybody working on this building site must wear a hard hat for safety reasons. And you could say, well, this guy's wearing a hard hat and he's observing the process. But the outcome has been lost in the, uh, in the process and, and you, he shouldn't really be passing um, the, the governance process there because because he's, his head isn't really safe. And I think that's where we've got to in, in a lot of the effort that goes into security is, is very pro process focused and not enough about outcome, not enough about stopping breaches happening. And this has become a much bigger problem since the advent of the World Wide Web by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Bernard Kiao. Uh, the, the technology they introduced facilitated a whole 
range of attacks that simply weren't possible before the World Wide Web was introduced uh, in the early 90s. And, and, and it's our job, I think, or it's somebody's job, and I've, I've kind of made it my job as one, one of the people, to try to prevent these attacks being possible. But I, there's no getting around the fact it's a losing battle. Um, the, the Verizon data breach report, uh, which is published every year, and there'll be a new one published soon, um, is, is pretty much painting the same picture every year, that the growth of hacking is, is absolutely incredible. And, and we are, these are data breaches, not just attacks. They're breaches where the attacker has successfully got in and done something harmful. And you know, where on the graph lower down, you can see the things like misuse um, is, is pretty much contained by all those policies and standards and procedures. The hackers, especially ones operating outside of uh, extradition treaty uh, zones, so um, without one to pick in any countries, there are places where you could do hacking and have absolutely zero downside. And your motivation would be, well, what do I stand to gain? And it, the, the gains are almost unlimited. What's the probability of being caught? Pretty low. Uh, what's the magnitude of punishment? Well, zero, because there's no extradition treaty. As long as I don't do any hacking in my own country, then nothing will happen to me. So, so they can come at our systems uh, continually. And they might only succeed one time in every few hundred or few thousand attempts, but they're making millions of attempts. And uh, you know, if they win, then, then we lose. And, and at the moment, this is the golden era for the uh, malicious hacker. And clearly, the way that we have been trying to defend ourselves and all those standards and procedures are not turning the tide. And, and we need a new technology for this, I think. And, and I believe that we now have it. So um, if you were to be a manual security tester, if you were to do the kind of thing that Ken Munro does um, or Paco Hope, you need to spend a lot of time learning stuff and trying things and reading a lot of books, learning a lot of tools and doing hands-on stuff. And uh, my security team, uh, they knew all 600 tools in the Kali Linux um, penetration testing kit, which is, that takes a long time to do. So if you imagine like a simple problem where you say, okay, there's a branch in a program and, and we're going to approach it with negative path testing. We're going to say, okay, is this value equal to A? And you could say, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm looking for negatives. So what is not to Z and not A? That's uppercase and lowercase. Digits 0 to 9 are not A. And um, some special characters are not A. And there's a bunch of other letters and strings that are not A. But there are other values where I'm not really sure what the branch in the program is going to do. So if I was to enter two capital A's, would that be considered 1A? What if I put in 10,000 capital A's? Would it overflow the buffer into some other area of the program where I might be able to start manipulating it? What if I put a lower case? The programmer may say, oh yeah, it's, it's case sensitive, but that may not be what the requirement was from the user in the first place. So this is the kind of questions we ask when we're testing. But then when you start throwing security testing into the pot and putting things like an apostrophe in, which might break the data entry mode uh, out uh, of context and throw it into dynamic code execution mode, then there's a massive number of other tests we could be doing. And if the system is intended to uh, try and block those kind of uh, obvious attacks, like an apostrophe or A equals A, and then comment out the rest of the um, verification, you could use obfuscation, so you start URL encoding the attack, and there's a, an enormous number of ways that you could uh, obfuscate an attack or um, a malicious string, and you'd end up going to infinity on a simple test 
like is this branch going to go one way or the other? So if you're going to manually security test uh, a big system, you will spend forever doing it. And it's a very good way of testing, but it's not it doesn't scale up. And now with the move from sequential development to uh, highly iterative agile and DevOps pipelines, we've really got a problem because there was already difficulty trying to do enough security testing with a sequential uh, development methodology. But now we have agile frameworks. We've got a shortage of skilled security testers. There really are very few around who, who are good. Uh, and the tools we use are, are kind of complicated and there's a lot you have to learn. Uh, and then you end up with this bottleneck. So you can't actually test everything that's coming at you. The, 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 until we finish testing, they don't like that. The, the, you know, it's, it's stuck in security testing. Or you descope tests, and that is becoming very common to just say, okay, let's take a risk-based decision and uh, we'll just test these bits here and, and not those bits there. And often those decisions are taken without a real good understanding of what is, has been impacted by changes or developments and, and what the real risks are. And, it, and it's, it amounts to more like ignoring risk than mitigating the risk. So uh, we're in a bad, sh a bad situation with the the skills short and the the speed at which uh, development frameworks are now operating. And traditionally, the way uh, we've tried to protect our systems, or the way the people responsible for security, it's been to sort of split it into two parts, to say, okay, in development, we will use static application security testing and dynamic application security testing. These are things that will static one will look at the code uh, early on in the project and the dynamic of the project uh, to, to the code to run. I'll describe those more later. And on the operation side, we have web application firewalls that are basically looking for signatures of malicious strings to try and block them. And the management systems, which are looking, again, for um, recognizable uh, strings, um, regular expressions, or for anomalous activity. Like if your whole customer database suddenly starts moving to China, the intrusion um, uh, detection system should say, wait, that's not right. Or you might have those um, attached to a thing called a security operations center, a SOC, and the SOC should send the alert to somebody to say, this is very weird, unusual activity, let's do something about it. Uh, unfortunately, hackers know all this, and they they have very good, effective means of working around them. But you know, let's 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 progress. So, static application security testing. Um, I don't usually do presentations where I sort of read out strings of, uh, of text, but um, for the purpose of explaining how we arrive at IASTA, I'll just sort of briefly say that something like a, a static uh, application security uh, testing tool. It's going to do model checking and data flow analysis. Abstract interpretation. It's going to apply logical rules. The call, you know, an easy way of thinking about it is it's it's basically like an advanced spelling and grammar checking tool, and those things are useful tools, but they don't know the difference between. Shakespeare and, and, and a nursery rhyme. And then we have application, uh, dynamic application security testing, DAST, uh, which um, that's performed by executing working programs on real or virtual processes and, and tends to be used late in the development lifecycle. Uh, and the tools function by scanning an application for an attack surface, i.e. like data entry points, including URLs, then fuzzing the data entry points with libraries of standard attack strings that are likely to harmlessly exploit a vulnerability. And then they look for responses that match the expected signatures. Uh, they tend to work well at detecting simple vulnerabilities, such as reflective cross-site scripting, uh, some SQL injections, some path traversals, some command injections, uh, liberal domain and path scope cookies, and some other low-hanging fruit. But there's a lot of things 
they won't discover. And, uh, and these tools are not very accurate. They've been around for about 15 years. They keep trying to improve, but it's really not good enough. Uh, so why, why, what goes wrong? Well, if you have some, the developers put some rudimentary input validation in to say, like, I won't allow an apostrophe to be entered into this um, data entry string, uh, it, the, the DAS tool may just give up there rather than probe for a bypass in the way an intelligent, intuitive human would. And um, the vulnerability may actually be triggered, but doesn't send back the, the expected signature that the tool is looking to match and say, oh, yes, yeah, I got that back. That means I've got cross-site scripting. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of other things that, you know, like logic flaws and, and design vulnerabilities that simply don't have signatures that, that you can program the tool to recognize. And in fact, uh, you know, some tool suppliers logic flaw as the things that their tools don't detect, which is, um, you know, kind of, <laughs> well, that's kind of cheating really. But um, uh, so I would say, you know, these tools, all right, they were better than nothing, but, but they can introduce a false sense of confidence that you found the vulnerabilities and now can go into production. And, you know, I'm not sure that that's better than, than having no information and just worrying about it and trying to be trying to build the things more carefully. And when there's been proper scientific uh, research looking at these tools, so if you, once you take away what the salesmen say, um, the University of California, Santa Barbara, found that uh, the false negatives, meaning, and by false negative, I mean it's telling you that there is not a vulnerability when there really is. So it's, it's, it's basically saying that's okay, but in reality it's not. The false negatives were very high, over 60% of vulnerabilities. So they built um, web, web applications where they knew exactly how many vulnerabilities were in there. They intentionally put vulnerabilities in there. But when they, the generic push button tools were run against them, they, they obey vulnerabilities. Uh, so that's not good. And uh, University of Coimbra in Portugal found uh, a lot of false positives. So that's like saying you have a vulnerability, but you, in reality you don't. And you then have to like waste time proving to yourself that you don't. Uh, so those, those inaccurate results are a real problem. And, and some people who work in things like security operations centers and so on would say, oh, we'll just, um, we'll just run a bunch of tools, run a whole load of different tools and correlate the results between them. So it's kind of, the, the, the thinking I think comes from security problem. Perhaps you'll then find out where the real vulnerabilities are. But those circles on the right hand side of the, um, the screen show you that these four tools, of which two were different versions of the same tool, only agreed on 21 vulnerabilities. But there were actually a lot more than 21 vulnerabilities. And even the, of the 21 that, that were indicated, not all of them were actually correct. So this is this is not good, and you know I'm I'm glad that the world is now changing. So, uh, OWASP, the Open Web Application, 2015, to create a new security testing benchmark, they created 21,000 security tests, and they ran pretty much all of the tools, both open source and commercial, against their benchmark. The commercial tools, they don't name them uh, because the, uh, the, the, the owners of those tools don't particularly want to be named. Um, but this, this graph that I'm showing on the screen now was the best commercial tool. And uh, we could say the bottom left-hand side of the graph would be uh, if you created a tool that said, uh, okay, I, I have no um, false positives, so I'm not going to tell you anything is a vulnerability that isn't, uh, because I'm not going to tell you anything is vulnerable. I'm just going to say nothing is vulnerable, then you have a zero false positive, but you also have a zero true positive rate. So it would be easy to make a tool that does that and just says, yeah, everything is, is, is okay. Uh, 
uh, but it's rubbish. Uh, and then on the other end, the top right hand side of the graph, you could create a tool that says, well, actually everything is vulnerable. So you have like a hundred percent true positive rate, but you also have a hundred percent false positive rate. So that's not useful information. You, you might as well just hand all the code to a developer and say, go back through it and, and take the vulnerabilities out. And I can't tell you where they are, or which ones they are. Um, so when you average out the false positive from the true positive uh, hits uh, in this tool, the, the, this tool has, is sort of better at some types of detection than others, as they all are, uh, the average score was only 32% accuracy, so less than one third accuracy, and that's actually the, the most accurate commercial tool in the market in 2015 application security testing technique, the static analysis of the code. And in my mind, and I hope in yours, less than one-third accuracy is simply not good enough. That's not acceptable. And and, and it's it's dangerous to, to put faith in these tools. And I'm glad to say that the new generation of IAST tools are up there in the top left-hand corner. So uh, when these tests were first run in 2015, the true positive rate was 97%, but with 5% false positives, the net score was 92%. In the following months, uh, the, the, the IS tool that was being used in the um, OWASP test was improved and got up to 99% accuracy. So it's a completely different league. And also uh, on speed, there's something to consider here, that in the OWASP benchmark tests, the fastest uh, static analysis tool took three hours, and the slowest dynamic analysis tool took two weeks. Uh, the score for this IAS tool, you can see it at the bottom of the graph there, on the right-hand graph, 135 seconds. So speed and accuracy uh, are in completely different lead type approach to detecting vulnerabilities. So there's a big scramble among vendors to say they have an IAST tool, an interactive application security testing tool. And you're welcome to reject this interpretation, but in my mind, there are really two types. And you could say that you have an active IAST solution uh, where you're basically directly tying a conventional dynamic analysis, a dynamic application security testing product, and allowing uh, something like an application security expert who uses the linked task product to get more accurate and thorough results. But that's still basically taking snapshots in time. It's done infrequently, and it requires an expert for the configuration and triage. The, the type of IAST that I absolutely love, and I think it is really revolutionary and really new, it, it doesn't rely on any kind of exploitation or scanning whatsoever. It simply analyzes uh, the thread that's running through the application and, uh, and, and completely passively finds the vulnerabilities. And it finds pretty much all of them very accurately. That's where I think we should go if we want our, our business users to be free from care about security. So how, did that, how is that possible? I mean, people have said to me, well, this is, this is like magic, you know, is it even testing? So it all began in 2004 when the, um, when in this instance, it was the Java language, uh, but a lot of other languages have added a metadata facility in the years since. So um, in uh, J2SE 5.0, uh, or JDK 1.5, as it's otherwise known, uh, there was this metadata facility added, and it um, it was JSR 175. I guess we all missed it. Whoever who who saw that in 2004, but what the key statement it made was: it seems appropriate to add to the Java programming language a means of associating arbitrary attribute information with particular classes, interfaces, methods, and fields. We refer to this mechanism 
as the Java Programming Language Metadata Facility. And small as that is, it's had huge effects on, on IT. Particularly, initially, in application performance monitoring. So, tools like Dynatrace and AppDynamics and uh, New Relic, they are using that metadata facility to analyze in incredible detail the movements through everything in the application to then say, oh, here's your performance bottleneck. And that's, in my mind, that's a much better approach than trying to create um, a, a sort of a realistic performance testing environment and, and using synthetic data and, uh, and then trying to like, imagine what effect that will have in production. Instead of doing all that artificial performance testing, you just put the um, real-time performance monitoring tools into production and then if you're using like a DevOps or highly agile iterative framework, every time you make a small change to the production environment, the tools tell you exactly what effect that's having on performance. And if you introduce a bottleneck, you can either back it out straight away uh, or you can wait and fix it in the next release. And th what you're seeing in performance is, is the real performance of your application. And uh, this is fundamentally changing how we tackle performance testing. And you can say, well, is it, is it even testing? Because it's, it's monitoring or it's instrumentation. But you know, as per the argument we had at the, the start, I, I think this is still a type of testing. And amazingly, it still applies to security as well. This attribute testing, rather than an approach of negative probing and scanning, this evaluating attributes can be done in security as well. And uh, there was a guy called, uh, I'll, give him, I'll give him credit for it, Brian Chess, who, who was, I think, the first person to realize that Um, you could use attributes to evaluate it before his time, unfortunately, because when he came out with this uh, in about 2008, there was a lot of resistance from operations to any kind of, you know, fiddling around with production code with some sort of instrumentation. They didn't understand it, and it's thank goodness for the application performance monitoring or application performance management uh, tools that have blazed the trail here, because now over time it's become acceptable to introduce um, security instrumentation. So, except when it passes through the class loader, it becomes instrumented, and, and therefore it can now talk out to um, a tool server saying, this, these are the qualities of the, the application in terms of security or performance. And referring back to that diagram we had earlier where development and operations have this kind of two different worlds that don't touch each other, well, that can now change where you can introduce instrumentation uh, uh, to, to give context that then helps uh, if you're anyone who's ever been a developer or is a developer, you'll know how useful debugging tools are. You can see the flow through the program step by step. Every uh, accumulator or field or variable as it changes, uh, you can see where it's happening and what's happening to it, and then you can find the problem. Well, imagine if you can kind of miniaturize yourself and become like a debugger inside an application where you can see all the runtime flows, um, and you would understand. Oh, wait a minute, you know this. This string that appeared completely harmless has now become, uh, it's been transformed by an application correct. And because I understand all the uh, application and the libraries and so on, uh, then uh, I can say, right, I need, to, I need to block that. And this is, I think, the future of uh, application security is to, to unify uh, the vulnerability detection tools with what um, Gartner call Runtime Application Self-Protection, RASP. So that's uh, a tuned version of IAST 
that doesn't try and detect vulnerabilities, it blocks attacks in production. So, so I asked is for uh, development and test environments to find vulnerabilities, and RASP, Runtime Application Self-Protection, is to block attacks and report them in production because it understands what's happening as things move through the application. And uh, we end up in this, this new world now where the DAS tools, okay, they're good at not uh, reporting a lot of false positives, but they're bad at reporting true positives, i.e. real vulnerabilities. And the uh, commercial static application security testing tools uh, are a bit better than random guessing, but for the money they charge, you, you know, you really want more and you really need more. So T working in uh, the IAST field and working in environments where they use IAST technology, because for me there's no going back to DAST and SAST. And, uh, and, and a word of caution is there are some open source tools that fall below that random guessing line on this graph here where they, uh, they're actually better, you're better off not having a tool at all than, um, than you looking at the advice of what the tool reports. Uh, and I think this is going to fundamentally change the role of uh, testing because with these kind of tools, uh, when I asked a tool, and I've seen it, I have first-hand experience of this, when you show uh, it to a developer, it, it blows their mind. And, and they want to, to like use that tool all the time when they're developing. So, so we can shift down to work closer with development and, and, and in the way that um, you, know, you can be uh, pairing and, and helping doing the auto right automation uh, for, uh, develop for automated tests and so on. This is a different way of shifting down to work closer with the developers. But it also, um, you know, of course, everybody's trying to shift left to prevent defects. And um, the sooner you can catch things in the pipeline, the better. Well, you can, as soon as anything is deployed to the Jenkins environment, you will find them. Um, and you can shift right into operations. The, the runtime application self-protection um, tools, they, they run in operations and, uh, and they work very well. Uh, but also the thing I find most interesting is this idea of shifting up as a trusted advisor because um, most businesses are not pure technology businesses, but they are becoming increasingly reliant upon the technology. And the people on the business side are often unaware of technical developments that, that can change the business model. So they may take years and years to come to you and say, oh, is it possible to do such a try it? So I'm going to give you an example of where I think um, IAST enables a business model to completely change. So uh, at the moment, we, our systems are becoming uh, incredibly, unmanageably large and complicated. Um, to, to, for a human being to go through uh, even a car software, that's a hundred million lines of code now in, a, in an average car software. And that's almost as much as mouse DNA. And uh, a financial organization, if we took a say, fairly reasonable sized financial organization, might have a thousand different applications. And if each one of them has a million lines of code, and that's not a, a big estimate, we'd end up with a billion lines of code. So it's, you know, there'll be lots of financial organizations that have a billion lines of code. The thought of trying to manually test that lot is, is well, it's farcical. And, and to use old-fashioned static and dynamic application security testing approaches, we're only going to find at best a third of the vulnerabilities. So that's not good enough. Um, and it's not just us realizing this is bad. The business This side are realizing, wait, we're, we're having more and more breaches. Everybody's getting breaches for managing risk, for taking or making sure that somebody deals with risk. They cannot ignore risk. It's uh, they're legally responsible now. So uh, the growth in cyber insurance is rocketing. It's growing faster than the spending on trying to prevent breaches. So although it's not as big in total, uh, it is growing very fast. And um, there's a, a massive market there. So there's huge business opportunities for insurance companies 
to to write um, policies to uh, pay out if the customers. But the big problem is the brokers and the underwriters understand even less about application security than than our, us and our colleagues do. They they uh, have no understanding really of what a security vulnerability is in an application. So their traditional model of pricing uh, an insurance policy would be to um, to look at the historical data, but that doesn't work uh, at all well in, um, in in application security because a lot of businesses are new, a lot of applications are new, and there may be no claims whatsoever, and then a colossal mega data breach with enormous implications. Something that these um, brokers and, and underwriters are not aware of at all is that well, we, have, we have new technology now where we could go through a billion lines of code in a day using IAST. We could, we could snapshot one application in a, in, a, in a large enterprise in a matter of minutes. We could in one hour go through many millions of lines of code and say, right, uh, if this is typical of your applications, then you're extremely vulnerable. And therefore, the underwriters' policies uh, should price the risk accordingly, something they can't do at the moment. They, there are some uh, to it using conventional techniques of, of plowing through uh, organization's code and saying, well, you know, it, it looks good, it looks bad, but it takes a very long time, it's a very expensive process. With, with IAST, you could, you could do a software as a service plugin if you were given permissions and within one hour have a good snapshot of uh, the quality of the code in terms of application security vulnerabilities and, and then an underwriter could sell a policy to that company that would have um, much better uh, risk uh, rating than um, than just the, the conventional techniques or, or simply taking a punt and not understanding it. So this is where I see uh, our role is to, to advise the business on things that are becoming possible through new technology that they would have no comprehension of unless we um, communicated with them. And that's not easy to do, of course. You know, that's, that's where it's over to you because, um, you know, the... The, the opportunities to speak to people who could then run with a project to to bring this stuff on board uh, are very small. You know, we tend to be we tend to live in another world. But I, I think I think um, we should be trying to shift up to become trusted advisors. And and to do that, you know, you have to know your stuff and you have to get the message across in a level that's um, understandable to those people. So the way I've pitch this presentation to you as testers, and maybe some developers, uh, wouldn't be appropriate probably to um, an underwriter, for example. And, there, and there'll be many other ways that IS technology could be used, but that's just one example. Uh, so as you can see, yeah, it's growing fast, and we, uh, you know, cyber insurance is just one example of something where we can deal with uh, the real world um, business case. Uh, whoops, I'm going the wrong way on my side. So uh, what's the future hold for us? Uh, well, yesterday and to some extent today, application security has all been about compliance. It's about people creating policies and doing a lot of governance and auditing, but it hasn't really worked. Uh, we're now seeing application security instrumentation. Uh, IAST and RASP is, is coming in. It's growing pretty fast in the States. In Europe, it, we're slow on the uptake. Uh, I did the UK's first implementation last year. I believe there are more about to happen. Um, Germany's in the game, uh, but very few at the moment. So uh, I think there's massive potential for growth. There's massive potential for you to change from being whatever kind of tester you are now to being an IAST type tester, somebody who's um, out there campaigning for it and, and facilitating it and, and using the tool. Because when it comes to things like the business logic uh, errors, um, that's where uh, you can customize these tools to have custom rules that, that fit your particular business. So you can say oh, uh, a user should not be able to arrive at C unless they've gone through A and B first or A or B until they arrive at C or something like that so that a, an attacker can't, um, can't just leapfrog past um, 
crucial stages, say, of a multi-stage process to avoid payment or avoid authentication and so on. So uh, there's, a, there's any amount of work to be done in these IS tools, but you could just use them as plug and play and you can go straight to a developer and say, you know, you've got these vulnerabilities. Now I'm going to try and get to the end of this presentation soon to give you a live demonstration. So um, I think as we move forward now, it's going to be about application security optimizing the strategy. So rather than piecemeal approaches to security, so we'll have this tool and we'll have that tool, it'll become like a, a cohesive, unified approach to security that then allows security to be used as a business driver. So you could say, right, our company you know, has taken security seriously. We're using this technology. We're, we're you know, doing things like the insurance example where you can price um, policies for cyber insurance using the technology that the competitors would have no chance of competing against. Uh, and it, also people will start saying, well, you know, why should I, why should I give my um, personal details to an to, uh, electricity supplier that keeps having data breaches when I can give my personal details to an electricity supplier that protects the stuff uh, and, and uh, looks after my personal data and information, my bank details, my addresses, and all the rest of it. Um, so people will choose companies that are secure over those that are not secure. And uh, yeah, I see a, I see a bright future for security. It's not a it's not a losing battle where we're going to carry on seeing more and more breaches all the time. So I think it'd be a good time now to just make this seem more real. So um, I'm using uh, an IAST tool here, uh, where it's monitoring some applications. Now, I'm not going to use WebGoat as an example, because Jeff Williams, who created WebGoat to help um, penetration testers or security testers learn their trade by creating a deliberately vulnerable application with known vulnerabilities in it so they could find out if they could find them or not, he also uh, is involved heavily in this um, this particular IAS tool, so it wouldn't be fair to use that. Simon Bennett, who uh, is, um, you know, he, 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 he does work in security, but not for this IAS tool supplier, and I've actually asked him if he would consider creating an open source IAS tool, and unfortunately it's, it, it's not within his capabilities to do that in terms of time and effort. Um, so I don't think there are any, uh, to preempt the question, which I know is coming, are there any open source IAS tools? The answer is no at the moment, and the people who I think are most capable of doing it are not doing it. So Simon Bennett would be like, if he's not going to do it, who else is going to do it? Well, um, and uh, wrote the web application, Hacker's Handbook. Um, he works at he owns Portswigger in Nutsford in Cheshire. They are working on a commercial tool, so it's not happening there either. I don't see any free open source um, tools coming yet, IS tools, but the commercial stuff that I've used is very good. So let's, let's, um, let's try this. So I'm going to go to the Bodget store created by Simon Bennett, which is basically a fake uh, shopping website, and uh, I'm going to add some thingamajigs, so I'm going to add, uh, I think it's about 11 or 12 is the maximum I can do here, if I was a functional tester, yeah, 12 is the most I can add. I'm going to add that to the basket, update my basket, and I'll also go to the contact us screen, and I'm going to just say QWERTY. Um, yeah, QWERTY, there we go. So that's not a, that's not a security test, it's not a, it's not a malicious string, it's just, it's just QWERTY, it's completely harmless. I'm just putting data into the application, which when I hit submit, will move through the budget store, which has a, an SQL database at the back and um, uh, some uh, Java code. And now if I go to the IAS tool, and if you we're looking here now at this budget, fresh the page, and now it has seven vulnerabilities, three of them critical. Let's have a look at them. So, well, this isn't good. We've got uh, three critical SQL a database injection vulnerabilities, and we've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Now, for a, uh, a manual security tester to do that, um, it, it could take uh, quite a long time to have detected these vulnerabilities. There's no way they can do it 
in like one second, practically, as we just did. Um, so now let's look at this vulnerability. The cross-site scripting vulnerability. The tools uh, that the this is coming from the comments parameter on the contact page, which is true. That's why I did enter some comments, and uh, it's saying, uh, yeah, we entered this value qwerty. It's showing it. We tracked the data, which is accessible within the following code, and observed going into the HTTP response below below without in validation and coding, meaning. It's a, it's a dynamic SQL query. It wasn't um, parameterized. It wasn't a stored procedure to handle it properly. And it says the vulnerable code for this issue is in com.jsp line 63. That is groundbreaking. You can actually donate, and you can go straight over to a developer and say, you've got uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability, line 63. It's a dynamic query. And he'll say, well, he might say, well, I don't know how to fix that. So you've got a how to fix function, and it explains to the developer how to write secure code to prevent cross-site scripting. Oh, sorry, I was, uh, <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, and there's, there's a bunch more information here. So it's called um, micro-training. Uh, so it's, uh, it's like learning on the spot in the context of your job and, um, it, uh, it's much more effective than sort of uh, uh, classroom learning where um, people of different learning speeds and abilities and experiences are all put in a room together and then a few weeks later they've forgotten everything. This um, teaches developers how to write secure code all day, every day, uh, so they get it right. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it blows my mind that this technology now exists. I love it. And I see it as my uh, professional duty to like, make people more aware of it. I think that's the only thing that's holding us back, is the lack of awareness of these tools. Uh, so I don't work for any uh, IAS or uh, work for OWASP or submit voluntary work to OWASP um, to try and improve application security. Uh, and make our world a better place. And, and I hope that, that some of you will have sort of understood that message and, and will run with it. And uh, you know, if you, can, if you can promote this kind of technology in your workplace, security will get better and your customers will be happier. And, uh, and, and you can, you know, the, the barrier to entry is pretty low for you to start giving expert advice on, on application security when you can point out as quick as that. Uh, so I think I should probably end my presentation and see if there's any questions. Is that okay, Dara? Hey, Declan. I'm expecting Dara to pop in any moment now if you're still awake. You there, Dara? I'm here. Hi, now. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to open up my screen here again briefly and we'll go through a few slides then. But before we look at your questions, let, let me just wait for the screen to open here. Okay, we're back. And as Declan mentioned, he will be presenting at UK Star. He's also part of the program committee for this new uh, two-day testing conference, which will take place in London next month from the 27th to 28th. And he will be presenting a workshop entitled, Hey, um, hey What Just Hackened? We have another webinar taking place next week with another one of the committee members, Dorothy Graham, and she will be presenting on Are Your Tests Well-Traveled? Thoughts About Coverage. And it's not long now until the deadline for the call for submissions to speak at the Eurostar Conference 2017. The theme for this year's conference is the magic of testing, and the deadline is uh, the 5th of February. So to find out more about the call for submissions, just head over to the Eurostar website and you'll find all the information you need right there. 
And if you're also thinking about going to UK Star, then right now is a good time to book your ticket as we have an early bird offer. So right now you can get a ticket, a one day ticket for 299 or a two day ticket for 519. And this will expire on February 3rd. And if you're thinking of going as a group, we have our group offer, a group discount, where you can get four tickets for the price of three. And this doesn't expire. This will run right up until the conference itself. All right, so that's um, my few slides I wanted to go through there. So let's have a look at your questions. The first question I have for you here, Declan, asks, uh, in relation to Java, has annotation to be done to be IAST ready? Uh, no, the um, all versions of Java since JDK uh, 1.5 um, contain the uh, the metadata facility. So it's simply a question of installing the tool to turn it on and direct the uh, the introduce the, the metadata attributes uh, to to send them somewhere. So um, the tools I've worked with uh, come in two flavors. There's um, software as a service, which is very fast to install. It's about 15 minutes to um, to just put the hooks into the application and then uh, you still have the same code but it's telling uh, the Java to, to talk to a tool server at the um, tool uh, providers uh, site which actually is like cloud hosted I think. Um, the alternative is on-premise so that's, that's the one uh, I installed last year in the UK uh, because it was for security reasons we, we couldn't uh, take a chance on revealing any vulnerability information to the outside world. So it was uh, an on-premise tool server and we just had to uh, install it. It took um, about an hour to get it installed, uh, to get the, the, the applic Java application talking to the, um, the, the internal tool server, uh, which was a virtual machine anyway. Um, and then we Im immediately started uh, seeing like hundreds of vulnerabilities uh, and it went through about four million lines of code, including third-party libraries, in uh, well, certainly less than five minutes. I forget the exact time now. Uh, it's very impressive stuff. It works not just on Java, but on .NET, uh, on um, Cold Fusion, uh, um, uh, Node.js, and I think the next thing coming is um, Ruby. I think. Uh, but um, yes, so I, anything else, Dara? I have another question here, and this person is asking, how hard is it to get the IAS tool sensors in the test environment or production environment? Uh, yeah, that's more um, of a procedural thing, really. Uh, I asked, I wouldn't recommend putting it in production if you have any kind of performance uh, concerns. So if you were like a high frequency trading platform or a hedge fund, um, don't put I asked in your system because it will slow it down slightly. Not enough to notice it for most normal applications, but something where performance is critical. Um, I'm trying to remember the figures now. I think it's um, five milliseconds overhead for IAST on an average application. So five one thousandth of a second extra transaction time. Um, the runtime application self-protection is the one that's intended for production. So that's tuned uh, uh, to block attacks in production and run very fast. And I believe the average figure for RASP, if I recall correctly, is 14 microseconds. So 14 one millionths of a second overhead. So a normal application wouldn't notice second, but but high, tr high frequency trading platform might possibly be concerned about that. Um, so I'd go with IAST in uh, dev and test environments, QA environments, security environments, RASP, runtime application self-protection in production environments. And uh, it, as I spoke uh, in the answer to the previous question, it's about 15 minutes to get the software as a service version installed, uh, about an hour to get the on-premise version installed, but the most difficulties we, we ever had were with people 
people responsible for technical design authority and so on. There'll be a lot of where I work most of the So basically, whatever you want to do, the same decision is always to say no to it. But actually, that is not a pretty model. Once they started working themselves, they loved it. Um, so, so yeah, it's more of a battle with the process and governance people in your organization than it is in terms of technical difficulties. The technical stuff is pretty straightforward. I hope that answers the question. We've gone one or two minutes over, so we might take one more question, Declan, if that's okay. And this person here is asking, yep. um, will this approach work as well with mobiles, um, IoT devices, etc.? cetera? Uh, that, I, I'm not aware of a version yet that uh, is intended for um, specifically for mobile devices, but um, but basically, the, the IaaS tools uh, that exist at the moment work inside the uh, application server, so not on the client side. Um, they're working on the server side, and you know whatever your client is, whether it's a mobile device or a PC or a laptop or so on, um, it at some point has to communicate with the application server. And since HTML5, it's been possible to do a lot more. more processing at the client side. So you can actually have a database on the client side and so on. You could have vulnerabilities in there. So uh, there is an intention to um, extend this technology to the clients. And, and with, um, with the application performance management tools, they're already doing that now. There are prototype modules that uh, monitor performance at the client side as well as the application server side. And I managed to get into a conversation with kind of my hero in security, Jeff Williams, and, and uh, he confided in me that, yes, they are working on a client-side version of IaaS that would then sit in um, the browser. Uh, and uh, that way, we'd be very good at detecting things like um, a particular variation on cross-site scripting known as uh, DOM-based cross-site scripting document object model. Uh, so that's coming, but I don't believe anybody has released an IaaS tool that specifically runs in the mobile application yet. But, for, but hold, you know, hold on, it's coming, I would say. That's my answer. All right. Thank you very much, Declan, for, for that webinar. And Declan has also, uh, he was a winner of the best paper at Eurostar this year. He, he was joint winner with Zager van Hess. Uh, the, the, the title of the paper was Application Security Testing, A New Approach, and we will be sharing this paper with you next month, so stay tuned to the, you, stay, stay tuned to the Huddle website and to download it. And we hope you can join us as well next month at UK Star, and you'll be able to attend Declan's presentation there on um, or De Declan's uh, workshop. Maybe, Declan, you might want to tell us a little bit about what people can expect at this particular workshop. Yeah, we're going to kind of split it into two halves. So uh, we're going to, first of all, imagine we're the bad guys trying to break into uh, a government organization and, and to completely pull its pants down and do everything bad you could. Uh, and how would you approach that? A lot of... Um, Ideas that people are probably not familiar with, like malvertising. Uh, so, so how does malvertising work? How do people use malicious advertising to break into an organisation? Uh, and then the second half will be more about, well, how can we defend ourselves against these like evil, bad geniuses uh, who use malvertising? And um, uh, then, you know, and at the end of it, we should all feel good about ourselves and security, and uh, it should be a bit of fun. And it's going to be an amazing conference anyway, with tremendous speakers. Uh, I'm really looking forward to being there. Uh, and I, I think my workshop will be as good as the other three brilliant workshops that I'm expecting there to be at the same time. Excellent. We look forward to it. And thank you guys for coming along today. Thank you, Declan, for this webinar. And that's it from us now. And we've recorded this webinar for you to, to check out a little later on. So um, thank you again for coming along. We have another webinar next week, which you can sign up to on Huddle. So take care, everyone, and good day. Thanks. Bye, everyone.